Hi, my name is Shibni and today I'll be talking about the evolution of subversive writing by women authors during the Victorian period, which worked to counter commonly held notions that reading was a dangerous activity for women to partake in. This essay will look specifically at two women writers, Jane Austen and Evelyn Sharp, who wrote at different ends of the 19th century. In Patrick Brantlinger's introductory chapter of the reading lesson, The Threat of Mass Literacy in 19th Century British Fiction, the moral merit of a novel is described as being a point of contention, which highlights anxieties about mass literacy, and specifically what is being consumed en masse by all classes of readers. One particular anxiety is towards a whole gender of readers, and that's women. Reading was considered dangerous for women because of the idea that it may lead them astray or heighten their emotional responses, or cause hysteria. Yet at the same time, women writers are working and beginning to make a living through writing. Brantlinger writes, As a genre, the modern novel was born with an inferiority complex. It wasn't classical, it wasn't poetry, and it wasn't history. This is to suggest that the novel was born with a chip on its shoulder. Despite the content of the novel, it would be considered inferior because of the direct comparison to what it wasn't. Brantlinger continues, Most of the objections to novels and novel reading during that period, when the literary conventions of the novel were at their lowest point, have little or nothing to do with explicit politics and a lot to do with frivolous entertainment on the one hand and with gender and sexuality on the other. This suggests that content also played a vital role in the rebuke of the novel as an esteemed piece of literary work. Novels did not seem to serve a greater purpose than entertainment to pass time, and this was looked down upon. This in itself can be considered a very classist perspective because due to industrialization and the rise of mass education, there's a newly emerged group of readership that did read primarily for leisure. As literacy rates increased, many more people were able to read up to at least a grade school level of comprehension. This meant that there existed a large readership to whom classics, poetry, and history were either greatly inaccessible or simply just uninteresting and unimportant. Yet this is not solely a class issue, as this quotation points out. Gender and sexuality also played a large role in inciting the anxieties of Victorian society about who is reading. There existed a fear that reading was bad for women because the works were overly sentimental and sensationalized. The novel offered no moral instruction for women and just excited them, which was considered bad for them. And if women did not occupy their role in society correctly, that could hurt society as a whole. In the present day, there has been a major shift away from this attitude as women sometimes form the large majority of the readership for novels, and often hysteria and excitement is a part of fan culture. Some obvious examples of this would be the Twilight series by Stephanie Myers or the Hunger Games series written by Suzanne Collins. This anxiety around women's reading is especially interesting to consider because at the same time, there were many notable novelists who were women, writing, and earning a living through writing. There seems to be a coexisting miscongruency between women who wrote and the acceptance of the existence of a female readership. It is especially notable that different women authors countered these anxieties in different ways. Jane Austen wrote in the early 1800s, and the novel I'll be looking at, Pride and Prejudice, was published in 1813. Evelyn Sharp, on the other hand, wrote new women's fiction in the latter half of the century. I will look, I will look more closely at the story in Dull Brown, which was published in 1896. Austen's approach to oppose Victorian anxieties was to depict women reading within her stories. She often included many passages of women performing physical reading, and this was all to encourage women's reading. Her novels subverted the belief that women should not read by writing books for women that encouraged reading further. Sharp's approach was different in that her stories were more openly feminist, and this may be due to her writing decades after Austen, during the prominence of new women's fiction. Sharp wrote anti-sentimental stories that did not revolve around love and marriage, Her characters were often working women who struggled to balance the social pressures of balancing a work life and a personal one. Sharp's approach was noticeably more direct and imagined a world where women existed outside of the domestic sphere and patriarchal control of society, while Austen's characters operated within the realistic confines placed upon women. Over the course of the 19th century, it seems the defiant subversive writing by women seems to shift from more subtle to direct and evident. As mentioned earlier, one of the major defenders of the novel was the novelist herself, Jane Austen. Pride and Prejudice is a story that follows the lives of the Bennet sisters, Jane, Elizabeth, Mary, Catherine, and Lydia, as they navigate being young women of marriageable ages. As the family tries to arrange a marriage between the extremely wealthy suitor, Mr. Bangley, Elizabeth catches the interest of Mr. Darcy. 
The story is firmly set within Victorian society and the pressures that came along with it. Austen's subversive messaging becomes more clear with the multiple references to reading within the novel itself. Patricia Howell Michelson, in her article, Reading Pride and Prejudice, writes about the importance Austen herself placed on the physical act of reading. Not only did she enjoy doing readings aloud for her family, in her letters, she commented on the performance of her mother's reading, writing, Our second evening's reading to Miss Ben had not pleased me so well, but I believe something must be attributed to my mother's too rapid way of getting on. Though she perfectly understands the characters herself, she cannot speak as they ought. Michelson writes, Austin certainly wrote her novels knowing that they would be performed, and this seems clear in the huge chunks of dialogue within the story, which present the reader the opportunity to hear the story from distinct voices within the story. Michelson states, Austin fills Pride and Prejudice with dialogues that are almost like plays, connected by narrative passages, enlivened by the voices of narrator and characters. Very little is mere narrative, to be diminished by being read with unusual rapidity. Austin most probably learned the art of elocution from her father, who was a clergyman, which dictated the tempo of your reading, as well as other things such as emphasis, pauses, and gestures. Another indication of Austin's attention to reading becomes apparent in the continuous use of italics throughout the story, which directs the reader on how to emphasize or pronounce certain sentences within the story. Michelson writes, a reader who has not prepared this text beforehand would be most likely to stress tense, missing the point, Darcy's supposed arrogance. This means that the italics guide the reader for performative reasons, but also to aid the reader in understanding the true meaning of what is happening. The italics help to further emphasize the characterization of Darcy in these instances. This illustrates that the references to reading or novels within the story should not be considered arbitrary or random. Austin was well aware of the effect that the inclusion of those references would have on the story, and as a novelist and writer, it can be assumed that she was trying to criticize anti-women's reading sentiments. One instance within Pride and Prejudice where Austin does directly mention novel reading is when their cousin wishes to read aloud to his sisters. This passage shows Mr. Collins' aversion to novels and could represent the views held by someone around the anxiety of novel reading by women. Yet Mr. Collins' aversion does not seem to be worth much. He is rather an annoying character who the main character of the story doesn't seem to think highly of or respect. Giving such an opinion to Mr. Collins seems to degrade the opinion altogether. The younger sisters, Kitty and Lydia, first bring him a novel which he dismisses and quickly interrupt his reading performance because they are not interested in him or his serious book. Mr. Collins takes the opportunity to chastise the girls about reiterating the ideas discussed in Bratmanger's paper, which emphasized that young girls should not read for entertainment or pleasure, but rather for their moral instruction. Austin explicitly names anxieties around women's reading within this passage. This is echoed in the article Conjecturing Possibilities, Reading and Misreading Texts in Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice by Felicia Bonaparte, who takes a more philosophical approach to the novel. Bonaparte argues that each of the sisters and characters within the novel can all be considered a different form of thought experiment. Lydia is a slave of passion, while Kitty is psychologically malleable. In the same vein, Mr. Collins represents the idea of authority, the notion that there are truths to be had from the wise or from the past, from our elders, or from religion, attacking, almost systematically, virtually every conventional site parents, social standings, cleric held, or 18th century culture by traditionalists at least, as the venue of authority, which ultimately Austin positions herself against. Bonaparte clarifies that Austin is not against authoritative knowledge, but believes that it must be continuously tested to be true, rather than blindly accepted. Elizabeth represents putting in effort to read not only books and letters, but also people and the world. In the scene where Elizabeth receives a letter from Darcy, the first time, Elizabeth misunderstands the letter, just as she misunderstands Darcy. It is the second time she reads it that she finally can understand it. It is this scene that explains the latter half of the novel's title. It is through this emphasis on reading that the entire title is given meaning. Darcy's pride is emphasized through the use of italics and directions on how characters speak. Elizabeth's prejudice becomes most evident when she reads Darcy's letter with a closed mind, shrouded by the words of the charming Wickham, who earlier in the story depicts Darcy as a cruel man who betrayed him. This is further supported by the article The Art of Reading in Pride and Prejudice by Gary Kelly, who writes, In Pride and Prejudice, however, 
the importance of correct reading is presented more immediately and dramatically by showing the heroine reading, misreading, and rereading a particular written text, a letter. Just like Bonaparte, Kelly emphasizes this metaphorical role Elizabeth plays within the story as someone whose curiosity drives them towards knowledge. Kelly writes that at first Elizabeth and Jane both attempt to justify their understanding of the letter by using direct passages from it, but Elizabeth cannot truly understand the letter or Darcy until she reads it carefully without prejudice and with an open mind. Ultimately, this imparts the message that it is important for women to read and read carefully. Austen writes a novel that challenges anxieties about women's reading, but also writes a novel that in many ways can be considered instructive and educational rather than insubstantial and sensational. Writing in the early 1800s, Austen intentionally operates within the ideals of Victorian society. This seems to be where the most significant shift occurs when a comparison is made to Sharp's work, who was writing in the latter half of the 19th century. Evelyn Sharp was a new woman's fiction writer. In Kate Flint's book, The Woman Reader, 1837 to 1914, she dedicates a chapter to new woman's fiction, which she describes as fiction written about women, for women, and largely by women. New woman's fiction directly challenges sensational stories by depicting the realities of women. This could mean writing honestly about marriage and sex. Or through writing about women as complex characters who do not exist to serve as a relationship to a man. The existence and popularity of this genre in itself speaks to a larger shift occurring in Victorian society. Women's rights movements, such as the suffrage movements that Evelyn Sharp herself was involved in, were gaining momentum at this time and attempting to change the narrative around the personhood of women. This means that Sharp was writing in a more tumultuous cultural milieu than Austen. Evelyn Sharp wrote stories about working women and attempted to depict the social reality that women faced as they readjusted to new pressures. Although many women wished to continue working and live independently, they were still expected to get married and raise children. One example of these stories is In Dull Brown, which was published in 1896, which follows the main character, Jean, who meets a boy named Tom on the omnibus on her way to work. Sharp challenges the fears around women's reading by writing directly for women, about women. In the story, Tom and Jean strike up a conversation and he immediately assumes a level of familiarity with her that he has not earned, all due to an assumption he makes about her line of work. Tom sees Jean and without knowing her immediately starts up a casual conversation about the weather. And this is seen in the passage. Nice morning, he said, as he folded up his telegraph. Yes, said Jean in a tone that was not encouraging. That the morning was nice would have never occurred to her, and it seemed unfair to sacrifice the effect over the green park, even for conversational purposes. Then she caught sight of his face, which was a harmless one, and in an ordinary way good-looking, and she accused herself of priggishness, and stared at the unconscious passenger in front, preparatory to cultivating the one at her side. We deserve some compensation for yesterday, she continued more graciously. Yesterday? Oh, it was beastly wet, wasn't it? I suppose you don't like wet weather, eh? said the man, with a suspicion of familiarity in his tone. Jean frowned a little. That comes of the simple russet gown, she thought. Of course he thinks I'm a little shop girl. Kate Kruger, in her article, Evelyn Sharp's Working Women and the Dilemma of Urban Romance, writes, Adopting a career did not simply change what a woman did with her time. It altered her identity. The bodies of career women were often read and associated with the occupations they practiced. This passage from the story directly confirms Kruger's assertion. Jean was a private teacher, but she was treated in such a casual way by a man she does not know because he made an assumption about her line of work based on her outfit. This means that having a career influenced the way that women were perceived by men and society, and they would be treated accordingly. Working women faced new challenges within society, and Sharp attempted to highlight them and their experiences. She wrote a story where working women could see themselves reflected in her story. By centering the story around working women, Sharp is also advocating for women in the public sphere. Jean meets Tom on a bus on her way to work, and this reasserts not only the right of women to exist outside of the home, but Sharp also explores new personal struggles that women face when they choose to work. Tom becomes very interested in Jean, and they seem to get along very well. When Jean falls sick and doesn't come on the bus for a few days, Tom worries about her and only seems to become more enamored with her during her absence. When they meet again, she explains her sickness and they agree to meet outside the omnibus route at her home. 
This suggests to the reader, and also Jean, that perhaps Tom is a potential romantic partner slash husband for her. But this does not end up being the case. She becomes held up at work and is late to her meeting. Throughout the story, she is depicted as the working woman, but she also lives with and provides for her sister, Nancy, who is the ideal domestic woman. When she arrives home, she finds the face of a man as he leaned forward in a low chair and talked to the beautiful girl who lay on the sofa, smiling up at him in a gentle, deprecating manner. Her sister and Tom entangle quickly as they welcome her home, but it is too late as Jean understands right away that Nancy has won the affections of Tom. Kruger argues, Nancy's environment is both literally and figuratively domestic because Tom encounters Jean in the urban area of the omnibus and associates her with the professional and therefore public womanhood. His conceptions of her femininity is both constructed in and constricted to those spaces. She may be an embodiment of a romantic fantasy for Tom, but is a fleeting one. This means that Jean was only a romantic fantasy of something Tom thought he could desire, but ultimately he really wanted the domestic woman, not the new woman. Kruger states, Jean becomes a mouthpiece for the discontent of many career women who are forced to choose vocational pursuits over domestic companionship. This is another way Sharp Story writes specifically for women about the issues that women are facing, such as being torn between choosing a fulfilling personal career or wanting traditional forms of happiness which accompany married and family life. Sharp writes a story rooted in realism that is ultimately truthful about the experiences of the new woman. On page 198, we can see that Jean, knowing that she has lost Tom to her sister, chooses to pour herself into her work instead. Although she feels wistful, ultimately she understands who she is and understands that she is perceived differently as a new woman. She tells her sister, my atmosphere, continued Jean in the same passionless tone, is the clever and capable one. It is the one that is always reserved for the unattractive people who have understanding, the sort of people who know all there is to know from observation and never get the chance of experiencing one jot of it. They are the people who learn about life from the outside and remain half alive themselves to the end of time. Nobody would think of falling in love with them and they don't even know how to be lovable. It is a very clinging atmosphere, she added sadly. I shall never shake it off. Nancy stopped making a becoming wreck of her coils of hair and looked more bewildered than before. I don't understand, Jean, she said again. Jean looked at her for a moment with eyes full of admiration. Don't worry about it, child, she said slowly. You will never have to understand. This suggests that ultimately she does choose her career. She does not choose to give up her career in order to be more like Nancy so that she can find a romantic partner. She chooses her vocational spirits over a domesticated life. This emphasizes the importance of women's independence and the validity of the choice to pursue a career. Overall, Evelyn Sharp's story serves as a mirror for young working women. Sharp encourages women's reading by writing directly about women to women. This seems to be a more direct act of subversion because Sharp does not attempt to validate and justify why, why women should read. Instead, she automatically assumes the existence of a readership of women and writes for them. She does not seem to engage with the anxieties around women's reading like Austin does, and instead seems to rise above arguing with dissenters by ignoring their fears altogether. Over the course of the 19th century, it becomes very clear that different women authors approach the concerns of Victorian society around non-instructive, pleasurable reading in very different ways. As time passes, it seems that the personhood of women becomes more concrete, and we can see this as Austin challenges these dated ideologies by still operating within the framework of the rules of them. Her characters have a mother who is desperate to have her daughters married. There is no other option but to marry well. The entire plotline revolves around trying to arrange a marriage between Jane and Bingley, and by the end of the novel, three of the five sisters are married. Austin includes the act of physical reading within her story to assert the importance of reading for women. Sharp, on the other hand, writes new women's fiction which is sensational and rooted within reality. Her stories do not seem to operate under the same oppressive rules as those seen in Austen's story. She automatically assumes the existence of a woman readership and writes about the true experiences of working women balancing a work life with a personal one. Women's authors are naturally literate and so proponents of women's literacy and reading. As working women, both Austen and Sharp earn a livelihood through their writing. They choose to address archaic and sexist ideologies in very different ways. This may point to the progress in women's rights being made over the 1800s. 
Although times and methods change, both writers hold steadfast to the belief that women should be permitted to read and should be allowed to read stories not only for their moral instruction, but for the pleasure of reading. Thank you.